Okay, so we will now start thinking about the role of mathematical modeling as part of reconstructing phylogenies. And to do that, we will first have a closer look at an issue that I mentioned in connection with the distance-based methods of phylogenetic reconstruction. Now, as you recall, distance-based reconstruction has as its starting point, like the other methods, a multiple alignment. Step number one is to construct the distance matrix, which is just a table of all the pairwise distances between the sequences. The number of mutations between each pair of sequence is the genetic distance between those, those sequences. Based on that distance matrix, we then try to construct a phylogenetic tree such that the distance is measured along the branches, what we call the patristic distance, is the same as the observed distances, the distances we got directly from the multiple alignment. As I also mentioned, it's not always possible to find a tree and find some branch lengths where we get an exact match between the observed and the patristic distances. In those cases, we instead try to get as close as possible, and by as close as possible, we discussed that uh, what we mean is that we have this measure Q, the sum of squared residuals, where we for each pair of sequences take the observed distance, subtract the tree distance, square that difference, and sum up all those terms. In the best of all worlds, we'll have perfect match. Observed will be equal to the tree distance. All of the terms will be zero and Q will be zero. If that's not possible, if it's not possible to find a perfect match, then the goal is instead to minimize Q. And we discussed last week how to do that uh, mathematically. Now, the reason we also discussed that it's not possible to find a perfect match between the observed and the tree distance is the phenomenon of superimposed substitutions or multiple substitutions. The main idea is that any given site in a DNA sequence can undergo more than one mutation. So if a site, if the first A here, for instance, mutates first to a C and then mutates to a G, then we will have had two mutations on that site, but we can, of course, only observe a single difference. This means that, uh, on the whole, we tend to underestimate distance. If we make a plot, I've sort of indicated it down here at the bottom of the slide, if we make a plot where we have time since sequences have diverged on the x-axis and the actual sequence difference on the y-axis, then you can see that the distance will not rise linearly, but it will uh, sort of uh, taper off and it will hit perhaps a maximum value. Obviously, distances can't go above 100%. Uh, so there is that limit, if nothing else. As I've indicated on this slide, uh, the relationship between the observed difference and the expected difference is not uh, completely random. There are some regularities, as I've tried to indicate, with the shape of this curve. And the reason for that is, of course, that the phenomenon here is very much like uh, what happens if you, say, roll uh, 100 dice uh, and you try to figure out how often would you expect to get 1s and 6s and 2s, etc. Okay? It's a stochastic phenomena, but if you have enough data, then you can start thinking about what you would expect. And it's exactly the same here. Imagine, for instance, you have a 100 nucleotide piece of DNA and you randomly have to select 60 positions in this DNA. There is a possibility that every single of the 60 mutations will hit a different site, but of course there's a rather large probability that you will occasionally hit the same site more than once. And in fact, using fairly simple mathematics that I won't go into, you can actually start thinking about how many different sites you are likely to hit. So the bottom line in all of this is that this situation where we have a set of sequences, we have some observed distances from which we can make a distance matrix, we can actually, using this sort of mathematics, start thinking about what is the, given the observed distance, we can start thinking about what is the most likely real distance between these sequences. Now to do that, we need to make some assumptions about how the sequences are changing. We need a hypothesis, or uh, what I call a model, and I'll return to that, a model of how the sequences have been changing, a model of how the sequences are evolving. For instance, you can imagine that uh, it's a different case if, you, if all sites are hit with the same probability than if some sites are more likely to mutate than others. It's also 
uh, different if A to C mutates with a different rate than A to T. So there are some assumptions we need to make, and based on those assumptions, we can then start thinking in mathematical terms about the relationship between observed and expected differences. And this is a good time to maybe just make a few comments on the role of modeling and, uh, in, in science and in phylogeny uh, uh, more specifically. So what is a model? Well, I suggest that a good way of thinking about the role of modeling is to see a model, a mathematical model of some system as a stringently phrased hypothesis. So typically when you do science, you uh, have some data and you then uh, c construct a hypothesis about the system you're looking at. And those hypotheses will typically be uh, qualitative uh, in their nature. As an example, I've, I've here put, uh, let's say you are looking at the growth of the population, then a, a qualitative hypothesis about population growth could be the population will grow rapidly when there are few individuals, but later on the growth rate will decline when uh, resources become limiting, when there's not enough space and not enough food, then you'll see a decline. So first a rapid rise, then it'll taper off and it'll be hit a maximum. So, so that's a qualitative uh, hypothesis. It's, it's fairly precise, but still it, it's, it's qualitative. It will allow you to make qualitative predictions such as growth rate will decline. It won't allow you to make quantitative or more precise predictions. On the other hand, a mathematical or arithmetic model of a system, you can see that as being a more stringently phrased hypothesis about the system. If you have a mathematical model of a system, you are forced to be more explicit. You need parameters describing various aspects of the system you're looking at. Uh, and once you have that, and once you have estimates of these parameters, you are then also able to make quantitative predictions. As an example, the hypothesis I phrased qualitatively above could be phrased quantitatively in the form that I've indicated on this slide. This is incidentally the equation for logistic growth that's also in the, in the lecture notes. This is a very precisely stated hypothesis about population growth. This is not the only quantitative way in which I could have expressed this particular qualitative idea. There would be other ways in which growth could uh, increase first rapidly and then taper off. But this is one specific way. I, can, I have some parameters, I have the carrying capacity k, I have the growth rate r, I have the initial population size and zero, etc. And based on this, I can compare my, I can estimate these parameters and I can then compare my model to actual data. And this will allow me to refine the, the, uh, the model, maybe add more terms or maybe adjust my estimates of parameters. So what I'm saying is, Thinking of a model as a stringently phrased hypothesis will, all, will, will often make it more clear why on earth it is we're even interested in, in trying to model uh, systems like this. So, another point here. The models that we make of systems, biological systems or, or other systems more generally in, in science, uh, they do not represent full reality. Okay? So, it is simply not possible to represent all the complicated aspects of reality in a model. And this is sometimes a criticism that people come up with. Well, this model is nothing like reality. Well, no, it's not. And, and uh, we don't actually want it to be, and it's not really interesting to make one that's completely realistic. To look at the growth model example, for instance, in principle, the growth of a population will of course depend on how many offspring every individual in the population gets. That will in turn depend on the fecundity and the survival rate for each individual. Both of those will in turn depend on a huge number of factors. Some of them will be biological, some of them will be non-biological, some of them will be internal, some of them will be external. You're going to have falling trees, you're going to have meteorites, you can have uh, inherited diseases, you can have uh, a bad immune system. Some of them will be stochastic, you can get an infection or you might not, you can drown in a lake or you might not. And those uh, in, in turn would have to uh, be, pre we would have to know about those for every individual in the population. So for every individual in the population, you have uh, parameters that are complicated, uh, you have the fecundity and survival rate that are complicated functions of huge numbers of different terms, some of them which are stochastic. This means that it's, and it's impossible to, to find good estimates for, say, 10,000 parameters for every individual in a population of thousands of individuals. 
So the bottom line is, it's impossible to make a perfect model of reality, and moreover, it's not really interesting. You can think of such a model as a one-to-one -one map. If you have a one-to-one -one map of, of uh, your neighborhood, you can see that that's not really handy to, to see it. You would have to roll it out and it would fill up your entire neighborhood and would in fact just fit uh, with the features that are already there. So one-to-one -one maps are not easy to read and they're not really very useful. Instead, it's much more interesting to focus on the main aspects of your system, to zoom out, as it were, and have a scaled model of, of the system. This uh, approach, of course, uh, is based on the idea that we, we or the assumption that reality has what I've called here factors with tapering effect sizes. Okay, I'm assuming that if you look at some system, then there's going to be a few very important factors that control the behavior of the system. It's going to be sort of a bit more medium important uh, factors, and then there's going to be a lot of uh, factors uh, that, that have a little importance. We will start typically with the most important factors, trying to get just an understanding of those, and then we can perhaps always uh, increase the complexity of our model if we want to understand further features. So models do not represent full reality. It's not interesting to make a model that does. One other word on the, this interpretation of, uh, of modeling, this way to use the word model as a a stringently phrased hypothesis also fits right into uh, your normal understanding of how science is done. We have this feedback loop where we typically start with collecting data from the system we're looking at. We then build a model or a hypothesis of how the system works based on the data that we've collected and various uh, representations we can make of that data. This model or hypothesis about the system will now allow us to make predictions about system behavior for unseen conditions. We can say, okay, if this hypothesis is true, then I predict that the mRNA level will be this when that happens, or whatever system it is you're looking at. Those predictions, which we incidentally call simulation in the case of uh, mathematical modeling typically, those predictions can then be compared to new data and we can use this in a feedback loop to refine our model or to maybe throw out our model and put in a new and, and better one. So model is a stringently phrased, uh, a stringently phrased sorry, hypothesis. That's a good way of thinking about it. Okay, so returning to the particular case with the, uh, with the distances, the genetic distances that we use to reconstruct phylogenetic trees. What sorts of models, what sorts of hypotheses can we have about the evolutionary process that will influence uh, the, the, the inference we make here? I recall that our goal here is we have some observed distances. We want to, based on those observed distances, estimate the real distances. There will be some sites that have mutated more than once. We're interested in trying to estimate the actual number of, of mutations based on the observed number of mutations. Well. The different sorts of hypotheses we can have about how sequences evolve include, as a very important part, the, what we call the substitution model, the model or the hypothesis about how nucleotides change to other nucleotides. I remind you that a, a substitution is originally caused by a mutation in the DNA, typically uh, due to a replication error during copying of the DNA, you're supposed to add one nucleotide, but instead another nucleotide is added due to an error in, in this uh, physico-chemical process. So this mutation might then be removed by repair or it might not. Uh, it might disappear from the population because the uh, mutation causes the individual to have very low fitness and then we will never see that mutation. Or it might, for, for either random reasons or for, for reasons of, of increased fitness, be present in the population. In those cases, we call it a substitution. A mutation that, that sticks around for long enough for us to actually observe it is what we call a substitution. So, as I say, an important part of modeling evolution is to model the substitution process. And the substitution process, as I've just said, is in fact a sum of many uh, individual steps. You have mutation, you have uh, repair, you have uh, selection, etc. So, a substitution model will typically take the form of a so-called relative rate matrix. This is just a table telling us for each possible pair of nucleotides the relative rates with which they, they change to one another. 
And the simplest substitution model that uh, we have is the so-called Jukes and Cancer model, named for the people that invented it. I briefly mentioned this previously. In the Jukes and Cancer model, we assume that all the different uh, possible substitutions occur with exactly the same rate, called alpha in, uh, in this uh, relative rate matrix. As a, actually, as a consequence of the fact that all substitutions are assumed to occur with the same rate, uh, the model also uh, assumes that all nucleotides will have the same frequency. Those two things are, as it turns out, linked. So these are some fairly uh, strict assumptions that are probably not realistic for most real cases, but nevertheless, they are one way of making us start thinking about uh, how substitutions can change and the possible consequences in terms of the relationship between expected and observed uh, distance. Incidentally, one thing I should notice is that if you have a relative rate matrix like this, then it's possible, based on that, to compute the substitution probability matrices. A substitution probability uh, matrix gives you the probability that any nucleotide will change to any other nucleotide for a specific time span. Okay, So if you wait 10 million years, then there's some probability that A will change to C. If you wait 100 million years, then there's a different probability, a larger probability, presumably. I won't go into the math there, but it turns out that you can actually derive the uh, substitution probability matrix from the rate matrix using uh, this uh, matrix exponentiation that I've, I've indicated here. I'm not going to go into this, just for now, uh, accept that it's possible to compute this from that. Okay, it turns out that based on, on these assumptions, and if you do some, some actually not that complicated math along the lines of what I was suggesting earlier, start thinking about how probable is it that you will hit separate sites or the same site more than once. If you start thinking about that and doing the math, you can actually in the end come up with a formula that tells you that based on the observed distance, you can compute the uh, estimated correct actual distance. In the case of Jukes and Cancer, the formula is fairly simple. You take the observed distance times 4 divided by 3, subtract that from 1, take the logarithm, natural logarithm, and multiply it by 3 quarters. Okay? For instance, if the observed distance is 0.42, plug that into the formula, then the estimated real distance is 0.64. You'll notice that the distances here are not absolute, they're not the number of mutations, instead they're relative distances, which just means that you take the absolute distance and divide it by the length of the alignment. So an observed distance between two sequences of 0.42 means that they differ at 42% of their size. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the the math, but, but uh, it turns out that this is the equation if we make these assumptions that correspond to the Jukes and Cancer model. So using equations like this, it's possible to take observed data, correct them for, for unseen mutations, and then use these corrected distances as the basis for building uh, distance uh, matrix trees. There are, of course, many other models of substitution that we could, uh, we could use. One of the more widely used ones and the sort of the next step up in complexity is the, called the Kimura two-parameter model uh, because it has now two se uh, separate substitution rates. In this simple model, it's assumed that A to G and C to C mutate to each other or, uh, with the rate of, or are substituted with each other with a rate of alpha, while all the other substitutions occur with the rate beta. That is different. This is based on the observation A and G are actually the same sort of chemical, they are called purines. C and T are also the same sort of chemical, uh, they, they are called pyrimidines. And it turns out that, that changes within each chemical group, A to G or T to C, is, uh, occurs more rapidly than changes between these groups. And there are many reasons for that, some of them have to do with selection, some of them with, with the actual chemistry. Bottom line is, this is another model of how substitution may occur. It's probably more realistic than the Jukes and Cancer for most data. Uh, and if you take this model and do the math, you would come up with a different formula for the relationship between observed and actual distances.
We could go on, of course, we could add more parameters. We could now say that not only are A and G and C and C different, but, but A, G and C, C also occur with different uh, rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, up to the point where every single substitution has its own rate. In all of these cases, it's possible to do th some math and start thinking about uh, the relationship between observed and expected distances. There's not a as it turns out, a closed form analytical solution in all of these cases, but there are other ways of, of doing it then. In addition to looking at nucleotide nucleotide substitution models, it's also possible to look at, at other aspects of evolution. For instance, we could instead look at codon codon substitutions. So for codon, for protein and coding DNA, of course, the most interesting unit of, of uh, of coding is probably the codon which encodes a single amino acid. So we could then have a 61 by 61 matrix of codons and for each possible pair we could then have a substitution rate. Or we could maybe build it more elegantly where we would say that, that some of these had the same rate, like for instance the dukes and cancer, but now for, for codons. Another aspect that uh, is important is that different sites in a gene do not necessarily mutate or, or do not necessarily experience substitution with the same rate. Some parts are much more rapidly changing than others. Uh, this is often due to selection. If you are in a very uh, important part of a gene, then it, it might be that mutations occur with the same rate over the entire gene, but mutations that hit the important part of, of the protein, where you have, for instance, uh, an active site, they will lower the fitness, therefore they will be removed by selection and we won't see them. So if you look just at substitution, you might see very different substitution rates uh, at different sites in the gene. Uh, and there are many other aspects of, of uh, the substitution process that we could consider. A brief word actually about uh, how to model different substitution rates at different sites in a gene. Now, in principle, we could have for every single nucleotide or every single codon or every single amino acid in a, in a gene or a protein, we could have a separate substitution rate. But this would give us a lot of parameters. And as it turns out, having many parameters means that we need more data to be able to estimate them well. So as a workaround for that, to avoid having a model with too many parameters, but still somehow modeling the phenomenon that different sites have different substitution rates. In phylogeny, we often use something called the gamma distribution. This is two examples of a gamma distribution. A gamma distribution is a distribution that, just like, for instance, a normal distribution, has a number of parameters that control its shape and location. The form that we use in phylogeny, we often have simplified it to a version where we have just one parameter uh, controlling its shape, typically called alpha. Here are two examples of different gamma distributions, one with alpha equals 0.1, which has very high at the very low values here. It doesn't go below zero. And then it tapers off until infinity. Another one with alpha 10, which starts low, then peaks around one and then tapers off again, a bit like a normal, but with a skewed tail here. Bottom line is we can use a distribution like this to model the distribution of substitution rates in a gene. So instead of having a separate substitution rate for each position in a gene, we would say, okay, if we were to, we can instead say, okay, if we have a gene, and if we now were to take every single site, take its substitution rate and make a histogram of all those substitution rates, then we can instead say that our assumption is that all of those substitution rates together would, fo would follow a gamma distribution. So it might be, for instance, that if we have one particular gene where we have just a few sites that mutate very rapidly and then a, min, a great many sites that mutate much more slowly, uh, then we might describe that by a gamma distribution of substitution rates with an alpha of 0.1. Okay? We now just have one parameter that we have to fit to our data instead of separate substitution rates for every single site. Alternatively, if there is a number of sites that mutate with approximately the same rate and then fewer that are fast and fewer that are slow, then we could uh, use a different alpha, like for instance 10 in this case. A final uh, phenomenon that I'd like to just mention before we end this lecture on models of substitution is that of time reversibility. So all the models of substitution that we will be using in uh, 
in various aspects in, in phylogenetic reconstruction on this course and that are used more generally uh, in phylogenetic reconstruction, at least typically in both distance-based likelihood and Bayesian methods, are of the form that we call time reversible. And time reversibility is, uh, again, not necessarily something that's, that's close to uh, how things actually are in reality, but it's more of a, a simplification that allows us to more easily compute things. So time reversibility in the context of substitution simply means that the amount of change from some state to another is the same as the amount of change in the other direction. So in, sub in nucleotide substitution models, this means that, for instance, the amount of A that changes to G over some time uh, span is the same as the amount of G that changes back to A in the same time span. This will mean that nucleotide frequencies will remain constant, and it also has implications for uh, how to compute uh, the so-called likelihood, which we'll return to in the next uh, lecture. Said more mathematically, for instance, the time reversibility in the example of A and G, for instance, is the same as saying that the frequency of A, which we refer to as pi A, the frequency of A times the rate with which A changes to G, this is the same as the amount of, of uh, A that changes to G per time unit, should be the same as the frequency of G times the rate with which G changes back to A. This particular model that I've written on the top here is one way of phrasing a time reversible model. This is the specific case called the general time reversible model, which is a widely used one. It's the, uh, it's the most, uh, it's the, 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 reverse, the time reversible model where most of the, uh, the largest number of different substitutions have their own rates. Okay, so every possible pair of nucleotides have their own substitution rates. If you phrase it in this way, where you can see that the nucleotide frequencies actually are part of the expression for the relative rates here, for instance, the rate with which A changes to G is pi G times beta, the rate with which A changes to T is pi T times gamma, etc. If you phrase it in this manner, it turns out that the model is time reversible. And you can see it in the example I showed you at the bottom here, pi A times the rate with which A changes to G, then becomes pi A times pi G times beta. On the other side of the equation, pi G times the rate with which G changes back to A becomes pi G times pi A times beta. And you can see pi A times pi G times beta is the same as pi G times pi A times beta. So this particular model, phrased in this particular maybe a bit puzzling manner, is by this definition, a time reversible model, and it's one we'll use quite often. At this point, I would uh, suggest that you should go and do first the manual exercise on models of substitution and then the computer exercise on models of substitution, because they will nicely complement the lectures that I gave here. In the manual exercise, you will get to do a manual simulation of evolution using a normal die, six-sided die, and you will uh, explore how the expected amount of change, uh, the relationship between that and the observed amount of change by simulating evolution in a short piece of DNA. In the computer exercise, you will have a closer look using, again, GNU plot uh, on, on some models of how sequences change.